All right, I have a lot to cover in this video. I really want to fit this into one video. I don't think I will, but we're going to give it a try. Move this out of the way. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the first isomorphism theorem. Now the numberings of the isomorphism theorems are a little bit up for debate. A lot of people include the fundamental theorem of group homomorphisms in the isomorphism theorems, but I, we're just going to call this the first isomorphism theorem. So let n be a normal subgroup of G, where G is a group, and let pi be the natural projection map that goes from G to G mod n. Uh, then um, the map h to pi of h, which is just h mod n, is a bijection. Uh, from the set, now this is not a homomorphism or anything because these are just going to be collections of subgroups. The collection of subgroups of G which contain H and it's the map is going into uh, the collection of subgroups of G mod N. Also um, when it's the case that N is a subgroup of H which is normal in G, uh, H is normal in G if and only if um, H mod N is normal in G mod N. And then here, i.e. in this case, i.e. when H is a normal subgroup of G, we have G mod H is isomorphic to G mod N mod H mod N. So this last thing, that's really what we're driving at in this theorem and everything else that we discuss is sort of just to make sure that all of this makes sense. Uh, so for example, for this, like you need to make sure that all of these are, can be defined and everything. Um, so, proof. Uh, we start with some uh, preliminaries. Um, so, let phi be a homomorphism from a group G into a group G, uh, from G1 to G2. Um, if H1 happens to be a subgroup of G1, then phi of H1 is a subgroup of G2. And this is obvious, I'm not, well, it's not obvious, but whenever mathematicians say it's obvious or it's trivial, what that really means is that there's no real tricks that come up. It's just something that if you go ahead and do sort of the first thing that comes to mind or maybe the second thing that comes to mind, it'll work. So when I say this is uh, trivial, what I mean is not that it's easy because this is advanced enough math where none of this is easy. Um, this is easy in the sense that you just check that this is closed under the group actions and everything works out super nicely. The identity is contained in here because this is a homomorphism, so it, it will... So H1 is a subgroup, so it contains the identity. V is a homomorphism, so we'll map the identity in G1 to the identity in G2, and therefore it contains the identity in G2. Um, if you have two elements in uh, phi of H1, then say you have a phi, H, phi H1 and phi H2, then um, their product, you can write phi of H1 times phi of H2 as phi of the product H1, H2, where that product H1 times H2 is taking place in G1, and well, it's actually taking place in H1, and H1 is a subgroup, and so that's in H1, and so you get this, and then inverses are similarly not hard. Um, next, if n happens to be a normal subgroup, and n2 is a normal subgroup of G2, then phi inverse of n2 is normal in G1. This is also sort of obvious, but let's, uh, 
Um, let's go through it. Um, first, you need that phi inverse of N2 is a... Um, is a subgroup of G1, and that's not hard to prove. That that's that's very similar to this proof. Uh, you just do everything, and it works. Um, so I'm just going to write that uh, phi inverse of N2 is a subgroup of G1, and for all G and G1, for all x in phi inverse of n2, we have phi of gx g inverse, let me write that a little more clearly, gx g inverse is going to be equal to phi of g, phi of x, phi of g, and then we can pull the inverse outside there because this is a group homomorphism, and this is going to be an element of n2 since N2 is normal in uh, G2. Because remember, this is just, we're taking an element of N2 and we're conjugating it by elements of G2. Okay? So, so that's the first page. That didn't take too long. Maybe, maybe we will get through a lot of this. Um, so we have this, uh, the first statement is, so that's, that's all, that's done with the prelims. Um, so now we want to prove that we have this bijection. Um, let's see here, to, uh, uh, to prove bijectivity, let's see here, uh, we know now that for all H in G, uh, if we look at pi h, this is h mod n, well this is going to be a subgroup of g mod n because this is the image under a group homomorphism of a subgroup. Um, thus, um, pi is a map between the desired sets. i.e. if we take something of the form, if we take a subgroup of G such that N is contained in G, we know that if we, um, if we apply, if we f calculate pi of H, then that's going to give us a subgroup of G mod N. That's exactly what this is saying. So we know that the, this, this map um, maps these, maps this set into this set, now we just need to prove that this map is bijective. Um, oh, I know another another thing to note. Note, uh, keep in mind that we're, we're sort of when we're talking about this bijection, this bijection is not this function pi, because this function pi maps g into g mod n, whereas the bijection that we're talking about maps subgroups of g into subgroups of g mod n. It just so happens that we evaluate this bijection at a subgroup by uh, we, 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 we use uh, we use pi to evaluate this function but it doesn't actually map from G to G mod n it maps from this set to this set uh, so I guess technically you should give it a different letter or, or different diff a different name but I didn't because it's just too much notation uh, so anyways Pi is a map between the desired sets, so we want this map to be bijective, so we want it to be injective and surjective. Uh, let's see here. To prove injectivity, uh, suppose K is contained in two subgroups H1 and H2, which are subgroups of G, are such that uh, pi of h1 equals pi of h2, i.e. H mod, h1 mod n is equal to h2 mod n. 
By the way, I know I know it's nicer when I'm like talking to the camera, but I'm trying to get through a lot here, so I'm just so I'm just sort of going. Um, so, anyways, so this, i.e., this. So we want to prove that um, that h1 equals h2. So let h1 be an h1. Then, if we look at the coset that we get h n h1 n. This is going to be in H1 mod N, just because that's where these cosets live. But H1, H1 mod N is equal to H2 mod N. Um, so there exists some element H2 in capital H2, such that H1 N is equal to H2 N. And so, in particular, now you could do a more slick thing than what I'm about to do. Um, there exists an n1 and n2 and n such that h1 n1 equals h2 n2. You should sort of get the idea that this is a little bit more than you need because what this actual statement is, or what this means is that for any n1, for any n1, h1 n1, for every n1, there exists an n2 such that h1n1 equals h2n2, which is stronger than what I'm using here, but for what we're doing, we actually don't need that strength. This this happens to be enough. Because now that we have n1 and n2 such that hn1 equals hn2, um, so then h1 is, we multiply on the left by n1 inverse, and we get h2, n2, n1 inverse. Now, h2 is obviously an h2. But n2 and n1 inverse are both an n, and n is, why did I put this k here? This k should be an n. n is a subset of h1 and h2, and so these n2 and n1 inverse, these are both contained in h2. And so this is an h2. Um, thus, H1 is a subset of H2 because this holds for every single H1 in capital H1. Uh, likewise, if you do the same exact proof but backwards, or you flip the ones and the twos, H2 is an H1. Thus, H1 equals H2. Um, this proves... Injectivity. Okay. Um, I think I might be able to prove surge activity before the end of the video. Um, so for surge activity, this one's a little strange of the proof. Um, let H bar be a subgroup of g mod n. Now we don't know a priori what these subgroups look like, um, but what we want is we want some element a or some subgroup h of g such that h bar is equal to h mod n, right? Okay, so let me get some paper towels. And let's erase this. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we are going to look at, okay, so h bar, h bar is a collection of subgroups of, no, no, h bar is a collection of cosets in uh, g mod n. So it's a collection of cosets, so it's a collection of subsets of um, it's a collection of subsets of G. And so what we're going to do is to find our set H, we're going to take the union of these subsets of G. So what we're going to do is we're going to define um, H as, so we're going to take the union over every single um, coset in h bar because remember h bar is a subset of g mod n which is so it's a collection of cosets 
So we're going to take the union over every single coset um, of every single element in that coset. And of course the elements in the cosets look like G, N, where N is in N. So this is the union over every single coset of the union of everything in that coset. Um, N is contained in H. That's obvious because, uh, for example, let's see, your H bar is a subgroup, so it contains the identity element, and the identity element in G mod N is just going to be N, and so um, we're going to have, um, and N contains the identity E, and so if you let G be E and N be E, then it works, and you prove that's in there. Oh, wait, no, no, no. No, no, it's, it's not the identity. What, what you do is you, you prove, yeah, so uh, this is a union. Um, one of the elements of this union is N. And so you take the union over all elements of N, and that gives you N as a subgroup of, or subset of H. If it happens to be the case that H is a subgroup of G, then what will we have? Then we will have uh, G, N is in H bar if and only if G is an element of H, if and only if GN is an element of H bar N. And so, in this case, we have that H bar is equal to H mod N. And that's what we want. We want some H such that H mod N gives us H bar. We want H bar to arise as a quotient uh, of a subgroup of G. So all we need to prove is that H is um, subgroup of G. Uh, clearly the identity is in H because the identity is in N and N is one of the cosets that's contained in H bar because it's the identity and subgroups always contain, it's the identity of G mod N and subgroups contain the identity. Okay. So now, if H1 and H2 are in H, then that means that their respective cosets are in H bar. Um, and so, if, you, if we look at H1, H2, N, if we remember how uh, the product is defined, it's just H1, N, H2, N, and so that's how we define the product in the uh, um, in the quotients in in the quotient group. But okay, so this is the product of two things in H bar, and so this is going to be in H bar. Um, so H one H two is in H. Okay, right, because H one H two n is in H bar. Okay, now if H is in H. Then we take H n times H inverse n, then this is going to be H H inverse n, and that's just n. And so remember, n is the identity element of this quotient group, and so then this is the inverse of this, or the other way around. Uh, so H1, the inverse of. Um, so a, the inverse of HN is H inverse N. And of course, HN belongs to H bar, and H bar is a subgroup, so it's closed under inverses. And so the fact that HN is in H bar implies that HN inverse is in H bar. OK? So since H inverse N is in H bar, we know that H inverse is in H. Uh, thus, H bar is equal to H mod N, because we've proven that H is a subgroup of G, and we know from before that that implies that H bar is equal to H mod N. Um, thus, our map is surjective. Hence, it's bijective. Okay? All we need to do now is we need to prove the normality statement of our claim, and then we need to prove the final part. And we are going to do those in the next video.